Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 57, and our books is Carcaridens, Outer Dark by Robbie McNiven, which we both have digitally. Well, the because book I'm is... not paying 90 bucks for a paperback copy. You're just no fun. Um, I was going to, but I didn't want you to feel left out. <laughs> <laughs> the book is about the continuing tales of the Carcarid and Astra as they go through the ghoul stars to fight the Nids. Everybody's favorite. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read this book, and I feel less bad giving this warning now because it did publish in 2018, making it semi-recently, Go ahead and check out the book and our questions and then come back to this podcast as we'll be talking about the book in detail from start to finish. With that, let's dive in. As always, did you like the book? I loved it. I really enjoyed this book. It was fun. Mm -hmm. This was good. Vulture porn. Yeah, I think I, I told you on the phone, like I got to a certain point as it kind of felt like a Guy Ritchie movie where you could see all the pieces moving together and you're just like, they're all going to meet and then chaos is going to ensue and it's going to be lovely. That's a pretty good, pretty good summary of it, right? Well, for me, so it was one of those things where as soon as they said that it was the Gene Stealers, right, and they send this I guess this detachment, it was like a really large detachment, to go and deal with them the whole time. I'm like, okay, they're going to have to deal with the patriarch. Like, how is it going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, for one, did not picture a dreadnought getting dropped to deal with it. There was actually a lot I didn't picture happening in this. So the dreadnought was just kind of a nice little icing on the cake. And we can talk about some angry dreadnoughts. They're not happy when they wake up. So talking about the parts that stood out to us, that's actually a thing that happens with a lot of the chapters. Like we've seen Bjorn, right? We have seen some of the Ultramarines ones. Um, Otto the, Locus from uh, the Brother the White of the Iron Wolf of the Lake. The White Wolf of the Lake. Like I feel as though some of the chapters they lend themselves really well to having dreadnoughts, and other others really don't. Um, there's been a few short stories that I've read over the years where they talk about like waking up a dreadnought and they're like, this is either going to go really well or not because some of them do go crazy. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because he's wearing like a Horus Heresy era level like, suit of dreadnought armor where, cause I had to look it up actually kind when they described it, I was like, ass. that's heresy level, which is, oh, Speaking of heresy level, how did you like when the Ashen Claws showed up in a Stormbird? That's right, it was a Stormbird. So we nice. were both like, that's an antique, be careful with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was because funny when I was, because I'm reasoning aloud to my husband, he goes, whoa, whoa, do you mean a Thunderhawk? No, it was a Stormbird. No, I do not. And he was like, What's really funny Damn. is that, so the uh, Karkaridans wouldn't think anything of that. No! If, nope. Well, because if, if there's that's any kind of stuff that they have too, right? If there's any other Adeptus Astartes on the planet, they'd be like, "What the fuck is that?" Kind of like what happened when we saw it in Ashes of Prospero. Yeah, Stormbird shows up, and it's like, which, yeah. if the Patriarch would have ripped apart the Dreadnought, I um, I think I would have had to like have words with Rabbi McNiven. I would have too. That's actually one of the first things I checked because then suddenly he stopped talking about the dreadnought. I was like, oh shit, did he die? And like, nope. He did he did not. He did not. Um they they did definitely have to like immediately give him the set a give. But <laughs> yes, they did. You did a good job. You go sleep now. <laughs> That's right. Yoink. Um Hey big guy. That's right. Sun's getting How's it going? Low. The sun's getting real low. <laughs> yeah, that's actually exactly what I thought of too when they talked about like how they were basically like he was already like inert mm. again. I was like, oh, oh, you poor baby. Just, just let the poor guy die. But now they can't. For his purpose. Chapters, oh my. Chapter's done God. as it is. Sorry, you're serving till the bitter end. So bad. But I did. I did really like the whole, like, that really stood out to me. Because you know how 
If you've listened to this podcast, you know my feeling on the nids and the gene stealers. I actually really liked when they described the patriarch coming in. Like, he's like, okay, dads have to come deal with this. Yeah, actually, that grumpy whole thing with them trying to, trying to, you know, coerce the patriarch to appear and everything. I actually thought of this really bad movie that I haven't thought about in forever. Do you remember Mimic? Oh my god! Yes. I remember Mimic. So, like, that was their whole thing, right? The only way they could have stopped this infestation was to find the one male. And they had to figure out a way to get him to appear? Harry? Did I just ruin this book for you? No, I love you. But, like, the number of movies you haven't seen, but you've seen the cinematic masterpiece, Mimic! Okay, so... To be fair, that came out when I was in college, and we had nothing to do in Waco. Okay, we saw okay, that's a lot of fair. We saw, I saw a lot of bad movies. Girl, I was dragged to see The Haunting for crying out loud with Liam Neeson and Owen Wilson. You know what? Still a better movie than Mimic. That that's fair. That's one hundred percent fair. At least that one had some like oh. funny stuff happen in it. If you consider some of the stuff funny, which I did. Yeah. Play. Oh, man. Mimic. Guillermo del Toro's early entries into the cinematic universe. Um, no. But, okay, that's that's a fair comparison. Yes. And that's always, it's always one of the things. And even as much as I hate the Gene Stealers and as much as I don't like the Tyranids, I do kind of like the concept of the patriarch. And I do like when we get the patriarch reveals because what was that we never remember the name of this book it's by andy clark with the librarian from the imperial fist the primaris librarian where they go and they fight with the gene stealers there's a wonderful scene Uh, in there yeah that one it's like fist of the imperium or something like that. that's actually exactly what it's called i knew that i was just seeing if you did um because you said imperial fist librarian right yeah yeah Mm -hmm. that's it that was the one um there was the reveal when the like head priestess finally like when the spell right. of the patriarch wears off and she's like oh my god I was worshipping that as father like you dumb bastards it's oh. not a patriarch it's a giant bug I think my favorite patriarch reveal was in Belisarius Call <laughs> okay literally nothing tops that <laughs> Because that was so soul crushing. Yeah. And because again, like when you're picking a lock, all the tumblers just fell into place and mm. you're like, oh God, I suddenly understand everything now. Like Highlander, I know everything. D. I, <laughs> I can't threaten to divorce you like on every <laughs> podcast we do. <laughs> um, but. I did. I, I really liked this when the pa- there was just something about the way he describes the patriarch. How it it reminds me of like when you were a kid and dad has to come and deal with the problem. <laughs> like he's just stalking in there. Like, all right, idiots. It's like wait till dad gets home. <laughs> Pretty much. And then how about a dreadnought friend? A dreadnought and a psyker with issues, which we'll talk about later. So, what other parts stood out to you, if any? Oh, let's see. I actually highlighted a whole bunch of stuff. My other favorite is when Tyberos oh. goes to deal with oh, the, the borders. Because I made a comment that that was a dig at the Blood Angels. Which one? All right, hold on. Wake up. Mm-hmm. That's not it. Basically, they kind of talked about, oh man, it was, it was a total dig at the Blood Angels, because it, it was actually mentioning about um, relics. Oh, yes. No, I know what you're talking about. When they talk about when they're walking through the ship, and they're like, unlike some other chapters that yes. have all of these relics and these reliquaries, and yeah, and they're like, no, we got nothing. Yeah totally a dug at the blood angels like these guys in a lot of ways are kind of the anti blood angels there's no so the other thing that really um stood out to me because i actually like 
spoke out loud. My, made my husband jump last night when I was reading. And I said, well, I didn't see that coming. It was when, um, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Inquisitor's name. I'm just not. The Inqu- Nazagwu? Just, no, I'm not even going to try. Okay. Um, when he was with Brant and they went into the Adeptus Arbides office and then they mm. all turned around and they had the black glittering eyes. I was like, oh shit. Didn't see that coming. Like, oh. Talk a bit about Nazagwu later, but uh, and that I was actually, scene I was like... I was like, actually keeping my fingers crossed and like, maybe he whips out some Inquisitor badass shit and survives this and then... Maybe it turns out that Brant kind of suspected that something was going bad, but he really is an okay guy. Something. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. Yeah. Although I also kind of chuckled when so they were when they were planning to go to Pi eighty five, and they're like, "Well, we heard there's a heretic cult." And I was like, "You guys have no idea." Well, that was really funny. I thought that was really funny because he's like, oh, there's a heretic cult. Whereas the Karkaradans are like, oh, there's gene stealers on this planet. Mm -hmm. Like, they know. Their information's a little more timely than Nizagwa's. Well, not only that, but, you know, they, psychers. Right, that too. Yeah. And they've been, Yeah. and they have already been fighting the Nids on the outskirts. Right. The Imperium to begin with, so... They like, have a little bit more information, yeah. but since they're like, oh yeah, there's a heretic cult that will try to uproot, you know, if we have time from, you know, trying to get this Karkaradans. And I was like, yeah, what are you going to do with the sharks when you catch them? You know, it's kind of like the dog who chases cars. What are you going to do with the car? I was just about to say, right? Like, what are you going to do when you finally catch these guys? Um, it's a whole other thing we'll discuss. So let me ask you this. Do you still enjoy the Karkaradans after reading this book? Oh, gosh, yes. I'm like, you know, I never, like, again, like I've said many, many times, I never thought I would like a watered-down chapter. Well, here's my watered-down chapter. And I'm actually... They're fun. I actually kind of like the Ashen Claws, too. Like, I mean, oh. the chapter master, I can, like, take take or leave. But, take or leave. Yeah, but everybody else, like, I just the whole idea, I think, is just fascinating. Mm-hmm. It, it really is. And like, the more we get to learn about their doctrine and their philosophy and just the way that they handle things, um, there's something just really fun about them. I know I mentioned it earlier, but like when Tybros goes to deal with the ship, with them boarding the ship, first off, I love when he's just like, close the airlock. These are men of few words. And just to be honest, when he the, talks, the red you're like, lake doesn't need to say very much. No, no, and that's one of the reasons I love him is he's not a speech guy. He's just dangerous as hell, and everybody knows it. Yeah, because even when um, Bill Shar was like, "Have I offended you? Like, why are you sending me away?" and Tybros didn't say a th- word. No one said a thing. And then he was like, "Oh shit!" Said too much sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry it's, yeah yeah I kind of like that he doesn't have to say very much um right it's just when when he does speak it's um intense and kind of some of the things he says are kind of genius you know uh yes I mean in a tactical in a from a tactical point of view so one thing I also found very interesting about you know the ashen claws when Bale Shar was sent there to treaty with them and they said um and they were talking about the forgotten one and nez was immediately like we haven't forgotten him i liked that too well and i'm trying to i was actually it's actually one of the things that i was just looking for right now and i'm having trouble because i know that i bookmarked it but i'm having where he says where he says you know we haven't forgotten him yes i I liked that concept. And so I really like the concept of the forgotten one mm-hmm. in general because it makes Here it, it particularly. It's on page. Well, okay. I'm not going to help you. It's on page yeah. 50 in my book. Um, 
Yeah, if I turned back now, I would not be a son of the Forgotten One. You dishonor his name. We have not forgotten him. Right. And yet you no longer serve him. We do. Yep, it is. <laughs> um, so, especially since it's already mentioned that they're an offshoot of the Raven Guard, the Ashen Claws are for sure. Very much so. And we've, we're kind of learning that some of the language that the Kerkeridans use are also a Raven Guard terminology, but it also seems they could be parts of the Night Lords as well, just in how they, they're, um, especially the Pale Nomad, his um, kinship with that one guy made it really sound like there was something to that, that they've known each other since the heresy type thing. Even though I know that he hasn't, uh, to, to Kaharangi has not been around that long, but it's just kind of what I was getting a sense of that. So it just, well, I think he continues I, to skirt around the Raven Guard thing, but this book was probably the closest that cements right. it, right? What, I think to me, that was the line. What really, really love about the Karkaridans, you know, they're almost, mm -hmm. in a way, they're kind of like the Alpha Legion in a way, in that right. they got this mystery about them. You don't okay. really know why they're exiled. You don't know what they did. You don't know exactly who the lineage is. We have ideas. It's the Raven Guard. Maybe some Night Lord sprinkled in there, but then you can always argue that Korax and the Night Haunter are two halves of a whole to begin with. Um, right. Yes, they're they're considered renegades, but are they really loyalists? You know, there's a, I, I love it. And same thing with Ashen Claws, especially. Like, they're like, you know, they're, they're renegades in that, yes, they've been exiled, but they're pouty about it. Well, if you know the history of the Ashen Claws, which, which they kind not. of talk about in here, they, um, they kind of talk about it in here a little bit, but we'll talk about them a little bit more later because there's a lot of weird stuff going on with them well, not not bad weird good weird interesting weird um but i agree i i liked the way that, especially the way that they pitted them against each other because the carcaridans they're renegade -y, but they are still very much they serve the emperor mm -hmm. they serve the imperium and they're fine they they don't need the laurels and they don't need the commendations and all of this stuff right of like oh my god you're heroes I don't need any of that. They are, it reminds me of one of my random favorite quotes from, I think it's, I think it's the second book. I think it's Clash of Kings where, um, oh, okay. and I think they kept this. Yeah. I think they kept this line in the show too. But when Tywin Lannister says that a lion does not concern himself with the opinions of sheep. Right. Yeah. That's very much the Karkaridans. The sharks do not concern themselves with the opinions, right? They know who they are. They know what they are. Mm -hmm. And I don't got to explain shit. Nope. Which really liked, really liked that about them. They're very quickly becoming one of my favorite sub chapters. I just like the whole idea of them and the idea that they're Raven Guard. Potentially. Ish. Ish. <laughs> is fun. Yeah. I, so let me ask you this. Are you invested in, okay, so now it's my turn. I think this is what I was saying. Kari? Kari? I was saying Kari. Kari works too. Are you invested in his story? Well, I mean, I was, but I think his story's done. Well, I mean, I guess it is, but it isn't. Yeah. At the same time. I thought it was very... So what did you make of the reveal? So, I didn't... I told... You know what? I had totally forgotten about that whole demon thing. Like, I knew who he was. You know, I knew who he was from the beginning. It took me, like, a few pages, and I was like, okay, now I remember this guy. But I totally had forgotten about that whole demon thing. And, right. And, um... But when you find out what it is, it really clicked. Like, well, that makes sense. And why she can... Why Rannick can see it too because um the flayed father put that imprint on her with by using the demon so she would have something something like that still in her why she's able to see him and actually and i would actually i would argue that's like one of her that is her best moment in the entire book when they're when cowrie and the demon are arguing and she's slowly getting her shotgun ready and then she yells i remember you 
and shoots. Like, yep. So that was probably, that was uh, that was her best moment to me in the entire. Book. I would agree. I would agree, and I really loved that because if you recall in the last book, it kind of fades to black. Like they talk about him. He's going to use this kid as a vessel for a demon. And then he gets interrupted. Well, we he gets interrupted, but we don't really get a lot of details. The next thing we know is Tekaharungi has him and is kind of like, okay, it's fine. We're going now. This is our new psyker. Okay. Well, like but the demon, like what, what? I just figured that it got totally cut off and that was that demon's been banished. It's all good. Right. So, Which I think you were definitely supposed to assume. So when he's with the Ashen Claws and they're like, we got to cut the taint out. I honestly had no idea what they were talking about. And with the markings on his back, no idea what he's talking about. It really wasn't until the reveal of what the, the, the mourning woman in the veil, or the woman in black with the mourning veil, uh, what that was. It was like, oh, right. I had kind of forgotten about all of that. Because honestly, that book was so full of chaos. <laughs> it, uh... The demon was Unne- kind of easy to intended. forget about. It kind of was, honestly, because you're right. There was just so much going on, and it was so hectic that when the demon finally gets revealed, that's actually kind of funny now when I think about that in hindsight, that the demon wasn't even the craziest thing about that that book. I don't know. I think the craziest thing was all the infighting, and then the sudden, um, just everybody kills one another, and then the rest of the Night Lords are like, whoop. <laughs> We didn't like that guy anyways. <laughs> we didn't really like either one of them. Time to go. It's been real. <laughs> Pretty much. Just like, peace. Night Lords are out. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's always a little interesting when, like, a demon is not even the most interesting part of your story. Uh, you would kind of expect them to be, right? But, um, I... Well, I'd argue he's not the most interesting part of this story either. So, I like Kari, and I like his story, but I don't know that I was, like, super, super invested in him. Like, when they revealed it, I was kind of like, oh, interesting. Okay, that makes sense. Like, I liked that it was like, oh, okay, so you didn't forget about that. When you kind of just gloss over what happened to him, that was Mm -hmm. intentional. Right. I liked that. That was a little, um... So... I, did, I don't know but, about you. But at the end, when he's talking to Bail Shar and he's like, I mm-hmm. can't deal with this. Like, he's talking about he's like, going to have to leave. And Bail Shar's like, no, you need to talk to Keharangi. He can help you with this. And I was like, if he, I hope he does go. Because if he gets up and pouts and leaves till he deals with this, I'm going to be very disappointed in him. I will be very disappointed if he goes like Renegade, just to try and figure it out. Um, I have to imagine that Tekaharangi, he actually... And this is what, so one of the interesting things about both of these books is that you remember how some people were like, oh, when we read Silent Hunters, they were like, oh, this breaks the canon and blah, blah, blah. First off, no, it does not. I don't see how it does. I still don't. It, I still don't either. I but think it fits just fine. Especially just since uh, Silent Hunters doesn't even feature the same people. Yes, it has Tekaharangi in it. Yes, it has Red Wake. And that's it. Right. A couple people, I think the names I recognized, but I was like, Right. It also takes place like that. This book really, despite them giving you dates, they're not use particularly useful dates. I didn't find, so it wasn't like, well, these dates don't line up. But I was kind of having a hard time reconciling this Tekaharangi with the one that we see in Silent Hunters until this. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> there's the Tekaharangi that we know and love, mm-hmm. taking a few too many liberties. And I honestly kind of feel like. It's not that he can't teach you how to get rid of the demon. He was just kind of hoping that, like, if we just ignore it, it won't come back. Or I think he was also like, we don't need to address it right now. That's something that he needs to deal with on his own and figure it out. I really think. Right. And I think that was was, a test. That's a big reason why he sent him alone with this. I I think so, too. I mean, yes, he definitely, definitely, they definitely needed a psyker to help with the nids up where they were. But. I think this is why he sent him alone. I really do. I 100% agree. Because at first he was like, look, the Red Wake needs to have a librarian here. Well, he has a Taya. 
So for a while there, yeah. I was like, what? Like, is it just because you're the shiniest? Like, the most powerful? Like, what? And then, yeah, the whole black, the whole woman in black reveal. Oh. Well, and it was good that Teika Harangi was there, because then he, like, thanks to him, he was able to uh, deceive the Ashen Claws. <laughs> What's so, what is so funny about that is that Bail Shar told Nez, I was like, they are not mine to promise. And then Teka Harangi promises him, and Nez doesn't question it. <laughs> He's like, well, he promised them, so therefore they're mine, not thinking that you've already told that only the Red Wake can promise them to you. Right. Like, you've already been done told this, but... Several times. It's one thing to ask Uriel Ventress for something. It's another thing to ask Tagirius for something. It's one thing to ask Bail Shar. It's another to ask Tekaharangi. I suppose. Right, so like, right, like I am sure, but also I think, I think that was just within his idiom, Nev's idiom, that he's just like, okay, great, thank you. He didn't, he didn't even stop to be like, the Red Wake okay this. Nope, you were just like, great, awesome, coming. I also think that Teka Harangi and the Ashen Claws, I can't remember his name, no starts with an A. Mm -hmm. They had this little arrangement going on, and they kind of knew. It was untoward there. Yeah, and they knew exactly, like, you know, the only way we're going to be able to get Nez to move is if we promise him this. Like, I, you know, and I really think that most of the Ashen Claws don't have a single problem with the Karkaradans. It's just their chapter master. Just because he they were in kind of a pissing match, right? Because mm -hmm. you're right. The guys who were on the planet were just like, this was fun. We missed this. I do like when he says, he's like, we really missed this. Right. Um, so let's jump ahead in our questions a little bit because I feel like this is a really natural point to blend these two conversations together. So first off, what did you think of that? When the Red Wake is basically like, can't have my gloves. They're not. Sorry. I don't care if they were promised to you. Like... I didn't promise him to you. Yeah, like, his tone, again, not a man of a lot of words, his tone was kind of, he kind of implies that um, he, like, fool on you for falling for this. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell you you could have this, right? Like, it's almost, his reaction is almost like, no. <laughs> like, sorry, you believe that. I do like when Atea is like, do you really promise those? And Teka Harangi's like, yep. And the Red Wake is like, doesn't say anything because he's like, okay, not his to give. I didn't tell but him to say that. <laughs> that was an interesting flavor text to him in particular. Because this whole time, right, they seem like they're more, they're a more noble chapter, right? And because they're loyalists and there's a little bit more um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like maybe a little bit more chivalry to them. Chivalry's not the right word for them, but maybe that they play a little bit more by the rules. Mm, I guess when it suits them. Very much so. So the fact that he's just like, nope. Here's the thing like, though. So the ultramarines never, and the imperial fists would never deceive somebody like that. No. I mean, they'd be clutching their pearls even thinking about it. However, Dark Angels would. The Dark Angels 100% would. And the Raven Guard might as well. Honestly, I could kind of see the Raven Guard pulling out that type of lawyerese. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't say you could have them. A person who does not represent my property said that you can have them. Right? Like, it was very... Right. Yeah, it was a, it was a pedantic argument, but like very interesting and I guess maybe that does play into their honor because he's like it's my property no yeah, and but, I did like when he's like but they can come here and duel me no for him honor. and they talk about that they're like honor is stupid <laughs> basically yeah but I do like when he's like sure come on we'll go fist to cuffs for him it's fine and the guy's just like I loved toys. that like here's like you know old man like because that's how I kind of am picturing but just because like they talk about his voice and it's like you know he's like you mm -hmm. want him can take him off my cold dead body pretty much yeah and, he totally Charlton Heston did that and Nez is like maybe some other time like oh okay you afraid of the old man 
Well, yeah. If it was Bail Shar, I think he would have teleported over there in a heartbeat. But he, that's not true. Because he challenged Bail Shar to the death. And then that's was, true. And then was like, no, you know what? We're going to put you in a gladiatorial match instead against a world, a world eater. eater. And, you know, and I actually did have, a, cool. I did have a vision of the movie Gladiator when he defeats him and he's yelling at them. He's like, are you not entertained? I mean, he's like. Oh, is, very much so. Yeah. I'm like this. I mean, it was great. I don't know if he does that on purpose, but Robbie McNiven actually does a lot of like what I think are very clearly very subtle nods to movies. Like when um, Rannick and them, when they go into that Arbatee's uh, precinct mm -hmm. and they talk about the guy with the visor who's frowning and then the girl who's very pretty with the short hair, clear reference to Dread. So, I was like, oh my so God, I've, never, I've also seen Dread and love it. I've never seen Dread. Oh God. I know, I've never seen Dread, but I've seen Mimic. Go on ahead. <laughs> but as soon as you said the visor with the frown, I was like... Why, though? I was like, hey, that does sound like Dread. Now that when you describe that, like that does sound like Dread. Just because, you know, I've seen the posters. Of course. Um, because Carl Urban's beautiful. Oh, um, I was actually it's thinking very... of the Sylvester Stallone movie. No, that's Judge Dread, and we don't talk about that ever. Oh. Ever. I thought that was we talk about Dread. I thought it was the same. No. Judge Dread is the cinematic abortion from the early 90s and then Dread is a masterpiece that's like grossly underrated and it has Carl Urban who is a gorgeous and if you put that man in a hat he's gonna sell it to you <laughs> it, look it's a Warhammer 40k movie it is Arbatees in a Hive don't at me so is it's, that, it's totally is that the movie that we see all the memes made from with Carl Urban it's like, well, well, yes. isn't, it, isn't the, the fire? invisible sea? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. The invisible cunt line. That is from The Boys, hmm. which is also wonderful. Anyways, he does just like a lot of little nods like that. And I don't know if it's just because I am such a pop culture, like I always relate things to movies or if he's doing it on purpose. So asking for a friend. I mean, I, but I'm... You can't convince me that the whole gladiatorial scene when he oh. yells at him like that's that, that's hundred percent gladiator. Hundred percent. Let me ask you this though, since we're talking about the Ashen Claws. First off, what did you make of them as a chapter? Sad. <laughs> kind of sad, huh? It's I like, mean, just the fact that they're so they're out there in the outer dark, just the same way that the Kerkaridans are, and they just kind of keep to themselves, like they keep these planets so that they can constantly, you know, replenish their numbers. Um, but then they don't do anything, right? It's kind of disappointing. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, that's why I loved so much when the guy was like, "Man, this feels good. I've missed this," because that's what you're purposes like even yeah, it just makes you wonder like why are you bothering replenishing your numbers if you guys aren't going to do anything and like even I'm, I'm going to actually defend the emperor's children here for a second like even the emperor's children who are hedonists and not really doing anything like I'm thinking about the exalted one right now mm -hmm. they're at least worshipping their god and they're happy like it actually reminded actually, but, me very much but they, okay but they are out doing things in that they find a craft world oh they're going there and they're destroying everything yeah. and you know eating as many soul stones as they can i mean they're doing right. things they're not just yes they got their hedonistic qualities about them I mean, they're still doing that in the background they're doing that on the way there that's their road trip to find mm -hmm. the craft world but they're still pretty much doing things and if the nids came their way you guarantee you better believe that they would be that no they don't care about the nids attacking the imperium but they don't want the nids near them right but like I guess what I'm saying is that I feel like they're living their best life. And like, even like the death guard, they're spreading grandfather's love. Like everybody seems to have a purpose. These guys, they were like miserable pirates. They were basically just pirates replenishing their supplies as they needed. But none of them Grumbling seemed about the glory days. happy. Pretty much. They kind of reminded me of Uncle Rico now that you say that. Like they could throw that football over that goddamn mountain. Right. Like it, yeah. it they kind of, they made me sad a little bit. Like I didn't, and I actually kind of found them repulsive too, because like, they're just like sitting around feasting and I'm like, y'all don't do anything. You're just pirates. You're glorified pirates, which I, yeah. 
pirate space marines. Maybe if they were rocking a tricorn like an orc, it would have made it better. Just saying orc pirates are like way better than space marine pirates. Oh, well, I mean, they were just kind of hanging out. Remember, like, remember when? Remember how badass we were? Yeah, and like demanding respect based on their pedigree. But it's like, yeah, but... That was 10,000 years ago. What have you done for yeah. me lately? I mean, at the very least, Basically. these like, Karakaridans are like, you know, no, we're not part of the Imperium, technically, but we're doing our best to protect it. Right, because that's the job that was given to us. Right. Whereas the Ashen Claws... And when I started reading the book, I always confused the Ashen Claws with the Astral Claws, which I know they're very different. But... I confused the two, and I. But at, toward the end of the book, I was like, you know what? Y'all should just go and join here in Blackheart. Go rule Nubadab, and I don't know, do something, do something with your lives. <laughs> right now, it's just wasted potential, and it it really rankled me a little bit more than I thought it would. Hmm. I'm sorry. But let me ask you this: What was their overall point in the narrative? I think to uh, kind of show both sides of the coin, because I kind of feel like the Karkaridans are like, you know, the heads and the Ashen Claws are tails in more way than one. Just to show like, yes, they're both renegades. These loyalists. Here's not really, they're not traitors, <laughs> but they're not doing anything else. <laughs> it was very much so last book, we got to see the brutality of the Karkaridans versus the brutality of, of the, the night, night lords night lords which was very very different and different yeah. cuz the night lords are cruel and they delight in that cruelty and that terror and this has always been one of those things especially in the horus heresy right now they're really leaning into with korax versus conrad of these guys are cruel and they like the terror tactics whereas we're just professionals have standards and the karkaridans have got standards right mm -hmm. it's not it's not personal. It's not passionate. They're not loving this really per se. They kind of do, but right. because they're space marines. And then this was more of like, okay, you think these guys are renegades? Yeah, let me show you what an actual renegade chapter looks like. It ain't pretty. Right. But I will say that I kind of felt like... I'm just going to pull one of my notes on my iPad locked. Um, I kind of felt like... So they were in the beginning that you, we got this juxtaposition between them, right? And I was like, well, that's very interesting. And then they show up at the end, and there's this big confrontation over Slake and Hunger, which I want to know more about that. <laughs> Citation needed. I, I want to know whose they really are. Right. And who, is, who do these belong to? Right. What is, their, what is the origin story of these gauntlets and where they came from? Right. Yes. Who are these? And one of the very interesting things is of course Conrad Kurz was renowned as having those two murder gauntlets too which were similarly charmingly named but like I would like I, I too I want to know who this is why do the Ashen Claws think that these belong to them because the Ashen Claws are the really only one guy says that though yeah, chapter master says that so yes and here's the thing about that. He didn't fight in the heresy, I don't think. No. So how do you know about these? I'm guessing from the former chapter master. It's been passed I'm down. I'm guessing so. But how do we know that this isn't some bastardized tale? That's why I want to know. I no, want to know. I actually so. kind of hope in the third book they touch on that a little bit. Because I'm assuming there's going to be a third uh, book, please. Uh, Robbie, Mac, third book. Like, Seriously. Please, I would very much like it. Um, this cannot but, be how Bale Shar's story ends. I need more of this guy. I need so much more of or, him. I like all of them. Take Kaharangi. I take more of that too. I would do really like Robbie Mack to write a book that takes place after Silent Hunters mm. and deals with the loss of Te Kaharangi. That would be kind of interesting mm. because these two books show you how integral he is to their whole organization. I mean, the Red Wake really relies on him. Right. Right. Like, yes, I, yes, I think he sent Kauri down like as a test, but he is so vital. And I did like at the very end there 
where Kauri says something, and Bailshar is like, I might have questioned that before, mm -hmm. but now you're starting to remind me of Tekka Harangi, so I'm going to trust you on this one. Right. Like, he's just so venerable and respected. I would really like to see what a chapter does without him now. Right. Which we didn't really get that impression in Silent Hunters. Like, yes, he was important, but not like this important. Or like, or Red Ties, you know, both of those. Right. Right. So I would, I would really like to see that. Um, I think that would be very interesting. And Lord knows there's enough stuff to fight over there. Seriously. Like, yeah. other than the Nids. I mean, because uh, the rift is open. Um, there's all kinds of things going on. Oh, I can, oh, tell, yes. I can tell you my favorite part of the whole thing. Actually, okay. it just dawned on me. I had this written down in everything. Hit me. It is when Rannick is going through kind of the ruins. Or like the museum. I think it's from a different planet. And they come across the statues of this rogue chapter that's saving the blood angels during the heresy. The obsidians. I fucking love that. That. So, in the overall narrative, I wasn't necessarily sure that it really served a purpose. Other than it was just cool. It's just cool as hell. When she talks about the obsidian discs and... um. The suggestion that maybe the obsidian discs weren't always there? I'm pretty sure there were faces there, but since they've been exiled, those faces have been smoothed over. But remember, they talk about how there's no record of who did that part of it. Right. I So again, I think about... It, we saw it a little bit in these books, but definitely in Silent Hunters. Remember the scene in the beginning where they just kind of appear? And then they disappear. Mm -hmm. I would love the idea of a bunch of them dropping on this planet erasing it, throwing those discs up there and just leaving and nobody knows anything. That's always a possibility if not the Blood Angels doing that. That was an exceptionally interesting part of the story. Mm -hmm. Just this idea and because you kind of forget about this and it does make sense because we know that the Imperium is vast, right? But the idea that there's just this planet, the Shrine World planet out in the middle of nowhere totally has the Karkarid and Astra up on Bas Reliefs. Right. That's kind of wild, right? And if you're I just chapters... love that they came in and saved the Blood Angels. It's like, ah, eh, you know, we got two bloody chapters. Think about it. Well, I kind of imagine them, though, like seeing like somebody like the Flesh Terrors and being like, how gauche? Control <laughs> yourself, sir. Well, yeah, because when I mean, we talked about, you know, Bail Shar, he was like, I must calm myself, like, not give in to the hunger. I was like, wow, that's blood angel talk or flesh terror very talk. So. I mean, it's very, very fascinating. Very much so. Or not becoming just a monster. Right. Right. When you're that far away from the Imperium, when you are a bloody chapter, which we know, again, with the Raven Guard, we knew we we know that some of the Raven Guard kind of tended toward Night Lordy tendencies, right? Because there is a very fine line between what the Raven Guard did and what the Night Lords did. Mm -hmm. So this idea that these guys are constantly in this war to be like, nope, I'm in control here. Yeah, I don't know how they would, how, I don't know how favorable they would be to somebody like the Flesh Terrors or something. But they saved their lives. That was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. And that shrine and Pepperidge Farms. That shrine world was Pepperidge Farms. They remember. <laughs> With the onyx Excuse discs. Me. They do remember. Yeah. So let's change gears a little bit. Nazagwu. As an Inquisitor. Was he a good Inquisitor? Oh, well, how do you define good? Was he a good person? I think so. Was he good at his job? I mean... He got himself killed, so technically no. He was very trusting, wasn't he? A little too trusting, although to be fair, they didn't know the extent of the heresy. They, When they discovered it was gene stealers, they did not know the extent of how mm -hmm. deep it had gone. However, 
uh, I think, wait, was he? Which Ordos was he? Was he was Hereticus. Hereticus. Okay, so he wouldn't know as much as, like, an Order of Xenos. They would know, like, we can't right. trust fucking anybody. We can't trust anyone. Actually, I would actually imagine Ordo Xenos being like, Welp, Sterminatus. Like, this, this Pretty is much. done. We're not even going down there. No. <laughs> Which, yes. Um, I, he was very young and we kind of know that from the last book, Mm -hmm. right? And it very much showed. So the scene that really stood out to me is when they're in that chapel and there's an attack and he's like, everybody stand down and Rannick charges forward, right? And she's like, she's got her gun a blazing. And he's like, I told you to stand down. And she's like, no. There was, like, there was action going on. How fast does Erasmus Kral just be like, yep, you're a liability? Oh, pretty much immediately. I don't think she walks out of there alive. No. Um, same thing with Eisenhorn. I think Kral, I'm sorry, did you, did you just question my orders? Kral would have given her one more chance, and so would have Eisenhorn. One more chance. I don't know. I, think, I feel like Kral I, especially would have been like... I No, I really do think he would have given her one more chance I really do um, although I guess it depends on how much how pissed they were about you know her bitching about the dress because that was getting old so I was like what are you five just put on the damn dress yeah she was uh, a five year old and just as ignorant as Emma Watson mm-hmm. of course it's her uncomfortable Anyways, sorry. Just having worked in bridal as long as I did, that I mean, drives you, me insane. I mean, yes. Can you move as freely in one of those dresses as you can in your fatigues? No. But no. actually, when I thought there, I was like, wow, you know, in Raven or, or Eisenhorn's retinue, if he told, you know, Elizabeth or Kara, put on this dress, they would say, which shoes? Pretty much. Yeah. Did you also get me shoes? Because mm-hmm. we want them to match. Right. Right? Um, Medea. I think Medea even would be like, oh, good. Yep. Yeah. She, we'll talk more about Rannick in a second because I have strong feelings she, there. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure I can let this go about Rannick. Because at one hand, like, I kind we'll of. Just him. I kind of liked her, sort of. I wanted to like her. I'll put it that way. But the dress thing rubbed me the wrong way rubbed me so hard the wrong way Um, like the fourth time she mentioned it i was like i get it and it just a lot of her interactions just made me think like you think you are more important than you really are and we kind of saw that in red tithe as well you know very much when she was trying to move move up in the wardens and where did that get her well i nearly got her killed several times uh nearly there was actually that interesting comment that nazagu's and interrogator made where he was, because remember, he gets stuck back at home, mm-hmm. home base, with the astropath. And he even says, he's like, I'm the interrogator, not her, like she seems to think. It's like, yeah, that kind of is basically where she's at, right? But, where she's just like, yep. But at the same time, I think he needed to have her close because she was a liability. If he had yes. sent her back to watch the astropath, I don't think he could have trusted her to stay put. Whereas the interrogator no. knows his role. But, again, I don't see Crowell or Eisenhorn or even Ravener keeping someone like that around. Who's like, I can't trust this person and all they do is bitch. Like, how many of his audio logs does he leave where he's like, she's becoming a liability? Like, she's been a liability three entries now. Mm-hmm. I... So did well, you I'm like, saying, like, I know you said you wanted to like her. I'm was there anything Krell, you liked about her? Kral would have, yeah, Kral and Eisenhorn Ravener, especially Ravener, because he was so forgiving, would have given so. one more chance. But I think after that, they've been like, you got to go. And we all know there's no retirement plan with the Inquisitors. No. So, uh, and I, and I can't. All it would have taken is if he explained to her, you do realize that if you're not going to work out, you have to go. And I don't mean go out the door. There would have been a tough talk, I feel like. Um, I 
I guess I just, I was really disappointed in him with that. Um, and a lot of his, you know, a lot of his decisions he made, I was a little disappointed with. I think with her, he was kind of like me and that he wanted to like her. He wanted to right. trust her. He saw her worth as a fighter mm-hmm. and everything else. But I mean, she was not a good fit. She's, she wouldn't have fit on any inquisitorial team because you have to blend in and sometimes you have to get dressed in things that you don't want to be dressed in do you think that right. Elizabeth loved in every little thing she had to wear or Kara well think about all the situations that Elizabeth got put into and Elizabeth doesn't say she... mm-hmm. she's just like okay well, well because, because I she think... understands this is what you need or this is what the situation calls for and I don't but know also, how many times he told her, like, we have to act like we're supplicants in this, like, you're, you're supplicants in my retinue. Why can't yes. I wear fatigues? Because you're supplicants in my retinue. Well, they get to wear robes. Grow you are supplicants up. in my retinue. Right. And we can't look like we're bringing in an entire inquisitorial force. I mean, okay, yes, it's uncomfortable. I didn't like wearing pantyhose when I was a child and I bitched as much as she did. But you know what? I was like 12. Yeah. And honestly, um, I don't know how my mother put up with me bitching at 12 because at 12, you're old enough to know, stop bitching. Right. And sometimes you got like, we were just talking, we had this big aside before we started podcasting tonight about bridesmaid dresses. Like how many uncomfortable dresses did you have to stand on your feet for several hours and for friends? Because this is part of being a woman. Right. Every now and then, not often, but every now and then you have to pretend. And I think the big difference is like Elizabeth and Kara and Medea and everybody else. Patience. <laughs> very much even patience. They realize, look, I am in service to an Inquisitor. And an Inquisitor is one of the most powerful beings in the Imperium. This guy could kill me if he wanted. No one would blink. I Like, they realize that they are not there for their charming company. They are mm-hmm. there because they are they serve and they are of service. Oh, hell. Uh, Covenant's retinue. The, oh, um, my goodness. The um, um, sister who wants to slash her wrists... She still put on a pretty dress when needed. Also, she saves all of her whinging for the other members of the retinue. Not to Covenant. Nope. She doesn't sit there and give her woe is I story to him. So I Nor actually found a dog woo. No, I'm not going to wear that to Covenant. Right. Now, Zagwu was kind of interesting because typically we see two types of inquisitors, right? We see competent or we see Competent, but unfortunately, not the nicest human being. Straight up evil or just really callous, Man, right? But where typically, does Ravener fall in that. God. Man, I find Ravener a little incompetent. You know what? Oh, shit. I want to argue with you, and I can't because now I'm just going back through. And you're right. When those two people show up. That's and he's I like, this can't. is fine. Yeah. That's what I will bring up. Ersenheim Ravener is the best in- Inquisitor. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> but is that just bad writing? Why not both? Okay, that's fair. But we haven't got to see that really green new Inquisitor who doesn't really have control of his retinue. And like, you also kind of get the impression that some of his retinue are loyal to him and trust him, but the other ones... Like the inquisitor, like the interrogator who's bitching, mm-hmm. right? And unhappy because he's like, yeah, I've been sidelined for this lady. And then the doctor even is kind of like, okay. Like nobody seems happy or like, not that people need to be, not that a lot of people are happy in the Warhammer 40K universe, but you know, they don't seem that on board with him yet. Mm-hmm. He hasn't proven himself yet. So it's really interesting to see that, right? That, yeah. There are some Inquisitors who aren't that great. And you know what? They end up killed. Because they... They effed up. They trusted them. Like, the fact that he goes with Brant like that. Like, that was when I started 
to not trust Brant when he went off with him alone. I was like, oh, oh, this is not gonna go See, well. I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. Um, now I was, I was pretty sure the pontiff had turned just because they pointed out about the flak jacket. I was like, that is too convenient. You're, you're right about that. And then, you know, when all the priests had obvious, well, whatever they were called, the devote, the devotat, <laughs> sure. Okay, the, that's the, a hard word to say aloud, by the way, the devotati, tatai, tatai? Devotati? I was calling them the devotai because I'm reading aloud and I was like, nope, I'm not tripping over that second Whatever made up Latin declension you're trying to work on. Yes. Anyway, um... When they all had turned, or most of them had turned, and that one guy was like, oh, no, we haven't turned. Oh, wait, yes, we did. When the uh, Kirkeridans showed up and basically saved the Inquisitor and uh, Rannick, I was like, okay, there's no way for sure. Like, I had an idea, but there's no way that the Pontiff is also not turned and everything. But I really didn't, because that one chick in the Arbites wasn't the one that unfortunately died. Kind of oh torn. yes yeah and i was like surely the arbites are, are fine like like brant seems now that i'm saying this though i remember how he immediately picked out the inquisitor and brought him to the pontiff so now i'm questioning everything i've already said well and here's the thing and this is why i say that i think crowl so it would have been interesting to have seen crowl in this situation the second that Brant was like, yeah, you know, usually he doesn't wear anything like that, but thank God he had that flak jacket on. Crowell would have been like, really? So he's chosen death. Like, he would have, I feel like he would have picked that up because he was a better investigator. Not, he's not even Ordo Xenos, but he just had a, he was a better investigator. I feel as though Nizagu's problem was that he was a little overly trusting. He, which, yeah. He, he was overly trusting. Like he, he, he didn't want to believe that the infection, because let's face it, that's what this is, has gone that far and has spread that far. As I'm two fisting Chick fil A lemonade and bourbon. <laughs> Been a rough week, you guys. Um, yes, you're absolutely correct. Still better and when again, I though. get that whiskey distillery. Oh. There. to tell everybody but, the story uh, we went to a whiskey distillery when I was on vacation last week and I don't like whiskey at all but I was like I'll try some and they had this um, whis bourbon and peach iced tea and I was like well because we're where we are in Texas and there's peach orchards like I'm sure this is like homemade peach tea and maybe that'll disguise the whiskey taste so that's what I ordered they put the whiskey in and then they pull out the refrigerator peach iced tea snapple Classy AF. Um, yes, that's actually kind of what I was thinking about there. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it was just, and I don't know if, I don't know if Robbie McNiven, please don't disabuse me of this notion if he didn't do this on purpose. But I did like the idea that, look, they're not all good. They're not all Batman, right? They don't all get to be at this Lord Inquisitor level where they're just badasses solving crimes and figuring shit out, right? Mm -hmm. Connecting the dots. And they're not Some of all, them don't get to that level. And they're not all like crazy heretics either. So, right. Because you know, that's, that's usually what we see, right? The really good investigators who are really good at their job. And these have turned. <laughs> right. Pretty much. Right. And that was interesting. That was kind of neat. The idea that like, look, they're not all awesome. And as you said, there's no retirement plan, right? Like they don't just go find some other job for you to do. I, I feel like I feel like the Warhammer 40k universe doesn't have a lot of people who fail upward, right? Sometimes it doesn't work out. So let's talk about Rannick though, because I know you said you wanted to like her. Did you? Kind of did at the <laughs> end. Um, really? Okay. Tell I me guess. more. Okay. Tell me more. I'm just tr trying to think. Like, so the fact that she did her best to go look for the Inquisitor, where he I, was. I um, will give you that. that. Yes. You know, she. This is the guy who did pull her out of that prison world. She does owe a great deal 
to him and to find him. And that's where I was like, oh man, he didn't pull some Inquisitor Jedi shit out and survive. Um, that was probably because he was there by himself. That's kind of a problem. Like, you mistake. Really see, uh, that is a rookie mistake. Inquisitors shouldn't go anywhere by themselves. Um, except to the bathroom, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> That's a, maybe. You, even then, you've got somebody there watching your back. Right, exactly. Making sure that the toilet isn't uh, rigged. Anyway, um, so th- there was that. Um, yeah, I think that was it. I'm thinking about it. I. Because the other okay. thing I thought was so childish about her was when she sees the Karkaradans and she just unloads her last pistol into them when they were like saving them. To the point where like the Inquisitor has to basically is like, would you just stop? Just, you know. See, I think that's the point where if, okay, to your point, if Crowell gives her a second chance after her bullshit in the church, I think that's the axe right there. Like you just open fired on space Marines. You dumbass. They can all kill us like that if they decide they want to. I, okay, and this might be a little bit of this player knowledge, not character knowledge thing, but I get really frustrated with this because I'm like, you encountered the Night Lords. You encountered some of the Karkaradans too, but you mostly encountered the the Night Lords. Mm -hmm. How do you mistake the two? I, again, okay. They don't even wear the same color armor. No, not even remotely similar. Okay, trauma chaos as we already said right i mean that was a chaotic thing right whatever mm-hmm. but her dogged insistence especially after these guys have been helping you carrie's carrying your boyfriend right like yeah i thought that was so like, sweet oh it was so sweet when he carries them and then it was all for nothing i was, I was devastated yeah when they sweet. talked about the guy eating his neck out oh. i was just like oh that's so devastating I'm, I mean, at least he was, like, under. <laughs> I mean, at least he wasn't awake for it, yeah, yeah I guess. Um, but, like, this guy's helping you. Like, the people that you saw on uh, the other planet... Zartan. They were not the helper to... Zartak. I wanted to say Zartan, but that's a G.I. Joe character. <laughs> uh, I, like, those people weren't helping. Like, you should be able to think and start processing like okay i was traumatized these people are awful and evil but they're doing all of these really good things and they're helping and they're here to help fight this heretic cult traitors don't do that no because if the night lords happened to be there and the gene stars popped up they were like oh we're out <laughs> we're not dealing right. with this or they would just be like all right we were gonna kill the whole population anyways so could be cool like you know what I mean like they would be there for terror anyways so as soon as like the gene stealers showed up they would have been like well this makes it a little more interesting doesn't it can have me a human flesh and a gene stealer flesh cape now they would want that goes with everything really right goes Mm -hmm. with everything it's great for the fall season I feel like the chitin would really like insulate well um I that really frustrated me and so at the end when she's like I have so much to tell you hey bitch you're gonna make more trouble for these guys because you can't figure your shit out never mind the fact that you never would have survived without Cowrie being there like at all he saved you from the bomb Um, he saved you from the gene stealers he yes you saved him from the demon I mean, or kind of. at least well, gave a good, damn good distraction so that he could... So right, that he, that's fair. He could finish off the demon. Mm-hmm. Um, but he could have let you go to the demon. Uh, he could have. He could have used you as bait. He could have been like, enjoy, <laughs> figure it out, human. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't, didn't. Kill, kill her when she was emptying her last pistol. Into him. That's that was a, a big thing too, I was right? Bale Shar just being like, what, "What are you doing?" <laughs> right? Like, are you serious right now? But you're absolutely right. Like, I wish, I wish she was just like a smarter. I wish she was smarter and could have looked at that and analyzed that and been like, 
huh, none of this is computing with my memories. And when she told the demon, I remember you, I thought that was going to be that light bulb moment. And she'd be like, oh, my bad. So where does she go from here? I mean, that's what the third book's about. And she Her takes uh, the new helping inquisitor, an inquisitor. Takes the new inquisitor hunting for them. Right. Could be. I mean, like, like, I mean, you could be right. It's like sometimes, like, man, you inquisitors, don't you have anything else to do? Like, surely, I mean, the rift's open. Seriously. You guys got other shit to do right now than go chase after what may or may not be a exile chapter because like, they don't know. Um, do you don't know who these people are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that aside, how there's so many foundings. There is right. no way the Inquisitors know every single watered-down chapter out there. No. No. And I... There are so many foundings. And I'm not... Like, I have no doubt there's probably some sort of, like, registry where you can be like, hmm, who has this? Yeah, do you think the Space Wolves did that? Do you, do you think... Well... They don't really have many. They don't really have successor chapters, really. No, but you, they have some failed ones. But you, you know, you, you know what I mean. Right? I know what you mean. Yeah, and you have Do to you wonder, like, the, how that the soul drinkers registered with the Inqu Inquisition. I mean, let's be real. Why not? I, well, I, actually, I would posit there's no way that they have all of the Blood Angel chapters, right? Don't they have all the Dark Angel chapters listed? Oh, well, right. Most of them are killed now, anyway. True. Not they the Dark were, Angel ones, though. They were devoured. They got devoured. Um, Zartek is a treasure. Um, but yeah, like, I doubt it's up to date. So, like, yeah, the fact that they are... Me I do like that that was at least Naz Nazagu was kind of like... We don't know what they we'll, are. Let's find out. We don't out. know what that is. Let's deal with the right. immediate threat. But does she start this... White, who is it? Inquisitor Frayne. Does she start like a wild goose chase on this maybe it's kind of what some inquisitors do to be fair yes actually and some of them like we've already talked about right like Sor uh, I almost said Sorak sorry uh, Nazagu already kind of did that right where he erases the records from Zartak which will then get some other inquisitor started on some wild goose chase that's actually probably, you know, if there's any version of a time loop that I liked, it's that because it's not a time loop, but it is at the same time. <laughs> it It is. Well, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, history is going to repeat itself here, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. So, but like, is that... I really want a third book. I'm not necessarily sure that I want a book of Frayne and Rannick hunting them. But I think that's I mean, what it's going to be. I mean, there's going to be something with Frayne yeah. and Rannick. Oh, for sure. Because otherwise Which they then, just would have left it at Rannick sitting there just waiting to be picked up. Pretty much, right? Which, along those lines, um, where does the book go for next? In general, the story. Mm. I just hope that Cowrie's in it. He doesn't go pouty off into the woods. Right. I hope that he's able to find some answers. I hope he's able to suss them out. Actually, since I just said I would like the third book to take place in a Tekaharongulus world, it might be interesting too with him having to figure this out on his own mm -hmm. while also serving the chapter. Maybe having some flashbacks to some things that Tekaharongi explained to him about how to right, do this. That maybe didn't understand at the time. Mm -hmm. But now looking back, he's like, oh, okay, I kind of see where we were going with this now. Right? Yeah. I just, I'm excited for a third book, but I am a little nervous about where it goes from here, if that makes sense. Yes. It does. Makes sense. It makes sense in my mind, which isn't saying a lot. Although... I just, I just know more Kirk Herodons from Robbie Mac would be a good thing. Yes. 
I very much want a third book in this. Um, although these last two books have been, well, actually the last like three or four books have been a little dark. I don't know why you'd say they were dark, you know, with like night lords and their flesh capes and stuff. The grim dark universe being dark? Go on. So I'm actually kind of glad that for our next book, while we wait for more new books to come out. We are going to get some levity up in this bitch <laughs> and dive in to Sandy Mitchell's lovely Caiaphas Kane series with For the Emperor. This is which I also, as I discovered digital today, I uh, was like, "Oh, I already have the Caiaphas Kane omnibus. This is this is great!" And I opened it up and I was like, "Hold on a second. I was like, well, which of these?" And then I go to Wikipedia and I look stuff up. And I was like like other books like before where this one starts and I realize I have the second omnibus oh that so hurts. I went to Amazon and was actually able to find paperbacks of the first and the third omnibus for less than ten dollars each so, excellent so, yeah so that's eventually coming on along the way you right got, you gotta digitally go down in your basement and hunt down your original copy I think they're in boxes lazy yeah Hundred percent. I was like, I could go down and dig through all of our boxes. I think I'm good. I think I'm totally good. Mm. So, and it's been so long. So, kind of like with Storm of Iron, it's been so long. I'm really excited to actually read it again and see like how it holds up. Um, and in my mind, it was super funny. So I'm hoping it still is. So the only Caiaphas Kane thing I've ever read was that one short story, and I laughed. Which is hysterical. So hard. Yeah. That one, I read that one because you had suggested it, and you enjoyed it so much, and I was like, oh, well, if she enjoyed it, like, we'll probably even enjoy it even more, because we know Caiaphas mm -hmm. Kane, and yeah, it's hilarious. Because aside from all that, that was the show. That was so great. So great. Oh, it was. This is a perfect ending to that short story. Really, I mean, yes. God, I wish I could write. The thing is, it's so serious, but he's able to write it in a way you're just like, oh, that is kind of funny or uncomfortably funny. Like when he's like, why don't you go take your girl you've been flirting with? Oh, well, she was part of the purge you just initiated. Oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> Some great comedy right there. I can't wait to read it because in my memory at least and that short story kind of reminded me of that his humor often saharan dry but very sharp see i love dry humor oh, i'm actually really excited for this so it'll be we haven't read an imperial guard book it feels like in forever uh when's the last one it might have been the rachel harrison book it might have been like Severina just not Rain? yeah not has guard in it I mean, straight up guard book. Yes, I think it was Severina Rain. I think it was Severina Rain. So this will be good. We'll get to see another commissar because everyone loves a good commissar. And I've always wanted to read these anyway, because just because I've heard they were funny. So I'm excited. This should be fun. Yes, I am too. Hopefully we won't need to go through all 10 of them on the podcast because hopefully there'll be books written by then. Please. God, I hope so. I well, mean, we do know that uh, coming out soon. And then I can bust out my copy from the vault. From <laughs> the vault. What's the name of the book? Hellwinter's um, Gate? Hellwinter Gate. Okay. Which I'm really excited about. But first, Caiaphas Kane. Caiaphas Kane. And then, because Hellwinter Gate isn't out yet. No, and then we'll have to wait and see if they release anything else before we figure out what to do next. Yes. Send your suggestions, thoughts and prayers, everything. <laughs> thoughts and prayers. Exactly. Exactly that. Do you want to take us out, Carrie? Yeah, I sure will. If I can get my mouse to cooperate. Nope, it's not going to cooperate. So anyway, so thank you guys. Love it. Yep. Thank you guys so much for uh, for being here and listening. So you've listened to the uh, you've listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding Kirkaridan's Outer Dark by Robbie McNiven. Stay tuned next time as we're going to read. I mean, I should have gotten my second omnibus out. As we read uh, the next, uh, as we read the very first Caiaphas Kane book, uh, For the Emperor. Did I get that right? For the Emperor? Yes. Okay. You did. All right, cool. 
So remember, we are not we are we are we are not affiliated with the Black Library or Games Workshop or any of its other affiliates. We are kind of our, we are our lone we are a lone entity. If you liked if you like this podcast, please please uh, like subscribe and all those good things to our vidcast on YouTube and the podcast literally when anywhere you can get podcasts. Seriously, like we're now on Audible as well. It's kind of funny. I know, right? So literally any, anywhere you can get podcasts. So with that, thank you guys so much. Good night. Good luck. I'm off there it is. Get you some chartreuse. Even though the Storm of Iron book looks much better. I don't know, it's still kind of a gold beacon up there. It really is. Point, it's like a patriarch. <clears throat> like just boom. It's not purple enough to be a patriarch. Yes, but it is sending a message in space. Like I'm pretty sure they can see that on satellite. You're probably right. Hmm. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everybody.